I'm a talkative person because I'm an SE dom. It's like my only world is the physical. My words are the only means of me getting out my meaning and intention. We'll see if I eat those words. She'll be entertaining others all the This is exactly where I wanted to go with it. <laughs> I would not dare <laughs> do this bump on a podcast with people. Welcome back to the Literally No Subtext podcast. I'm here with a very special guest, super excited. It is our first INTJ. It's the man that I like to lovingly call INT Joe. We have Mr. <laughs> Mr. Joe Arrigo. How are you, my friend? Oh my gosh. Honor to be here. I'm great. I uh, didn't, I, I have never heard you say INT Joe, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you are INT Joe in my life. I call you INT Joe. Oh, INT Joe just wrote a book. Good segue. So, everyone, INT Joe just wrote a book. I did. Joe, mm-hmm. I remember the day you told me about this. You messaged me and you're like, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a son soon. I'm really excited. I'm going to, you know, make sure that all of my admin and all of my main work is done by the time this, this, uh, this child comes so that I can devote all of my attention to this child. And then the child came. Congratulations. Very exciting. Mm-hmm. And within a few weeks, Joe just texts me out of nowhere and he's like, so I'm writing a book and I've almost finished. And now he's churned it out. It is a type manifesto, marble and sculptor. How mm-hmm. are you feeling about the book, Joe? I'm pretty overwhelmed by the response. I think it's been out probably for like two weeks and I've had I've like 81 sales. Amazing. So, and a lot of that's me directly messaging a lot of my audience with like a mm. template and a link and very overwhelmed by it. Uh, I think it came out pretty well on the paperback. There are some minor formatting issues that I'm like, eh, I can live without that. I could definitely do a better cover next time. But overall, I'm like blown away by I don't remember writing any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did the last 10,000 words I did in the first two weeks of my son's life, like sleep deprived. When he did his 4 a.m. feeding, I just stayed up and I was just like, ah, just attacking it. So mm. just going like a madman. So um, I'm proud of it. Yeah, you should be. That's amazing. You churned it out real quick. Classic INT mm-hmm. J right there. Um, I mean, I have attempted to, I mean, I've, the longest thing I ever read in my life was a thesis for my master's degree and oh, I was meant to work on that for a year and, oh gosh, that was painful. That was painful to sit down and write. Like I ended up writing 16,000 words and I just, I was like, never again, never again. Before that, I'd sort of dabbled with the idea of writing like a, a PhD thesis or something. I'm like, no, never going to happen. I feel like it's like a gift for INTJs to sit down and write long pieces of work. <laughs> really? That is the... Yeah. You know, people ask me about the process of writing, and I always say that I can only write 750 words max per sitting, and uh, I'm not somebody that can sit there for, you know, write 2,000 words a day or per sitting. I feel like the book came together through a bunch of little snippets that I wrote over time in Google Docs, and then I said, oh, I have, like, a core piece that I could it was like 5,000 words and I can build in each direction from it. But yeah, that's a, that is interesting. You say that there are some very long winded INTJs that I've read that are just like, Oh my God, get to the point. So you're, you're right. Mm, Yeah. Well, I'm very excited about it. I have not finished the whole thing, but I've definitely read, read through the first few chapters and um, I'm impressed with how succinctly that you are able to articulate your ideas. I think you make a really good case for how type doesn't have to limit someone. And why is it, I'm actually, you make a bold claim in the book. You say that understanding one's type is the greatest piece of knowledge that you will ever obtain in your life. Yeah. And he's yeah. nodding right now, ladies and gentlemen. He's, he's standing <laughs> by it. Well, I'm obviously biased and I'm sure it was not hard for you to agree with that or anyone in the type community to agree with that. But I am trying to figure out like what would be more um, insightful interpersonally for you to know like what what your type is like I mean maybe if you your genes and all that might be important too but you can't do much with that with type you can do everything with that so I really mm. think that claim is going to be hard to argue against yeah what do you feel like the ultimate message in your book is gosh that's that's really good I think if I were to try to be succinct about it, it would just be that type is real no matter your ability to 
believe that it's real. It exists out, uh, you know, no matter what, it's all pervasive. And um, there are way more applications of type than you could imagine. Um, I, I've definitely, um, you haven't got there yet, but I do this whole like 30, 40 pages on how you can use it in interview questions in job descriptions and in like creating a corporate org structure based on type mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. HR can use it. So I, I really use that like if the TE users really want an application, I lay that out for them. But I also have some of the philosophy like the, you know, no good book sh exists without a Keanu Reeves reference. So I definitely include a Keanu Reeves reference yeah, to yeah, make I my saw point. That. <laughs> and I thought you might like that because it was, you know, had some religion aspects to it. Yeah. But I was like, you know, for the audience, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. So I like talking about it because it's one of my favorite movies from 2005. Keanu is like trying to pitch Rachel Weiss on why there, um, you know, there is a God and a devil. And he's saying that there's a, there's a war going on um, for the souls of all mankind and the God and the devil can't directly influence the people, but they can, they, they can influence um, indirectly. And, She's like, no, I don't believe the. I believe people are evil. I don't believe in the devil. And Keanu says, well, you should. He believes in you. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's it. That is type. Like, it doesn't matter if you don't believe in type. It's it believes in you. It's just a like, thing. yeah. Do you think that politics? If you disconnect from politics, that politics doesn't believe in you? Or do you think that? Oh, I don't click on ads. I don't click on any marketing. I don't watch TV. Do you think that marketing? doesn't exist it doesn't affect you it affects you so type is if you want to embrace it you will have a better life yeah i love that that's a good message and i i that has my stamp of approval i want to ask as an f i was curious about this did you learn anything about yourself as you in your book writing process i i learned that you know fe is still a struggle for me there were some parts where i kind of had to tone down the like callousness of like saying something like I don't care if HR doesn't think it's right to hire by type <laughs> we're hiring by type it's the best way like so I, I had to kind of tone that back and I, I learned that um, I still have a lot of work to do in terms of I still have a lot of the work to do in terms of being being able to elaborate well so I hired an ENTP editor which was a great decision and one of my pieces of mm. advice would be if you're whatever writer you are hire your shadow type as the editor because they will find stuff that you can't imagine and she was like give me an example tell me a story give me an example so my book went from 13,000 words to 24,000 words wow. because of her and it made it what it is and I learned that being concise is not always a gift some people want an example and you know what the worst part is? They want to hear your story. So I had to really oh, like... for sure. Oh, that was ugly. <laughs> so I was... Ooh. The Genesis story in the background, made, it was gr It was hard for me to write that because it was so uninteresting to me. Mm, interesting. Wow, because when I was, I was reading the first um, few pages and I got to the beginning and you were like, there's a chapter I think that starts with something like, growing up, I was always different. And I was like... Oh yeah, we're getting into <laughs> Joe's background. Yeah, but I literally <laughs> I was so write, excited. I, I literally write. Growing up, I always felt different, and I realize that's a really lame thing to say. <laughs> yeah, literally, <laughs> that's so, that, that's actually yeah, that's literally what you write. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's a really lame thing to say. Like everyone says it. No, but I think it's fantastic that you did go and get that editor. I think isn't it just so cool when you know, we write something or we do something and then we sort of bring somebody in who's different from us, who's a different type, right? So they're seeing different things that we're missing and getting their perspective. That's how, yeah, that's how art gets more refined or, you know, um, these kinds of books and this kind of literature gets, uh, is able to expand its audience as well because you're able to relate to the feelers. You're able to provide examples for the senses, you know. So no, good on you for getting getting an editor, of a different type, especially, I guess. Yeah, and, and I started out, I actually had like, I had two INTJs start the editing process. Um, they ended up, they just ended up not completing it for whatever reason, but I don't think your own type will actually see, they'll mostly agree with you and you'll be, and they'll be like, yeah, 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 I get this. And you're missing the other half of your audience. Um, mm, I mean, theoretically, I guess like I could, I wonder if I should have, you know, got an ESFP which would have been like the actual let, the exact letter difference, but I think the function difference is the real way to do it. Yeah, interesting. Why do you think that is? 
because they're the mirror, the exact mirror of all the functions, they will they will not suppress the things that you actively will. So they'll be like, hey, hold on, you need more examples, NE versus NI, like less examples, one concise point verse. We'll give, like, Marina is her name, shout out to her, she's great. Um, she was like, I need you to go back to three of your clients and get three client testimonials to write about this. So I was like, oh, that's going to be so terrible, but it wasn't, it was great. And mm -hmm. you need someone to push you or you'll not, you'll not create the art like you said that you should. Yeah, I love that. Audience, if you're listening, definitely get your hands on a copy of Marble and Sculptor by Joe. Joe, where can we find the book? Etsy is where I first sold it, and then Amazon. So there's Amazon Kindle version, and then there's the Amazon. There is a paperback edition now, and there's also on, on Etsy, there's a PDF version, which can you can then upload it to your Kindle, but most of my sales have actually come through Etsy. The reason I like Etsy is they take less of a cut than Amazon. They don't have the reach and exposure that Amazon does, but the, it's just you can get the PDF. And then I just uploaded on Etsy the signed copy. So there is a si signed copy available. Um, if someone does order it, it takes like a super long time for the... So I order them to my an author's copy, which takes an exceedingly long time to get to you for some reason. But if you were to disorder a normal copy through Prime, you'd get it, you'd get it right away. But if I'm an author, it takes 10 days. So just if you order a signed copy, it'll take like a month for me to get it to you. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And for those listening, I'll have you know that I consider Joe's um, philosophy on type very much in line with the messages that I spread on my channel about not letting type limit yourself, um, not using type as an excuse for bad behavior. I think uh, Joe has a very healthy attitude towards typology. So definitely get your hands on that book. And with that being said, let's dive in to the next part of the interview, which um, I know that Joe is very nervous about because as an INTJ, he hasn't been able to pre-screen the questions that I'm going to ask him today. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and he's told me that he has faith that he can succinctly churn out the answers very quickly to each of the questions. And I feel like your determination to do so might usurp the need to give succinct and accurate answers. Oh, okay. What do you think? Let's see. Oh, by the way, I didn't even mention this. For those of you who haven't seen Joe's YouTube channel, it is called Ghost of Jung. You might have seen him. He actually was the first person to uh, do an interview with me. I think it was back like over a year ago. <laughs> he's, he's like fist pumping himself. <laughs> over a year ago, I think I had like 3000 subscribers. That was a great interview. One of my favorite interviews to this day. And we did another interview on my faith. If you're interested in watching that, that's all on Joe's channel, Ghost of Young on YouTube. Okay. So I asked you guys to ask me some questions for an INTJ on my Instagram account. We got a lot of questions, which is awesome. Thank you for the submissions that you guys always put in. I've selected 32 questions, wondering if we're going to get through them all. First question, Joe, are you ready? Mm -hmm. So this is from one of my Instagram followers. How, what, where, when, and why? It's a great question. <laughs> and um, the answer is that there are many layers to that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there is not sufficient time to answer that, so I'll have to skip it. Oh, woo, nice. Okay. Didn't take the bait. Question number two. Do you have trouble trusting your own thinking? Not anymore. I, 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 once again, with the type lens, you you can easily narrow down. Uh, you can easily focus on the like what you're not thinking about if you're if you're being aware. So not not anymore. I've seen the NI lead me astray. I've seen the FE lead me astray. But I think I'm, I'm I trust what I'm about now. Fantastic. And succinct. We love it. Question three. Have you ever had unexpected ultra extroverted moments when you shock someone who has only ever known you as quiet? Yes. Um, and always comes out when I'm drinking. So it's usually like dancing or like telling a really uh, flamboyant joke in front of a group of people. And like people are like, wow, OK, I didn't know that where that was from. So it's it's usually that it's usually if some. When I'm imbibing. Mm, that's when your inner ESFP comes out. Yep. Have you ever grabbed a microphone and sang karaoke? No. Will you ever? Only if you come to America. Oh, tempting, tempting. 
I pride myself on being able to get people up on a stage. Okay. Uh, I'm very good at it. Okay. Well. <laughs> and proudly. <laughs> See, this is what type helps you to do, ladies and gentlemen. Just own those inherently flawed parts about yourself. No, I'm kidding. Question four. What roles do FI and SE play in your life? FI is definitely the principle, the stubborn principle, for better or worse. Like, you know, just getting overly worked up about this is who I am. There's no, like, the, even if it's not logical and to go against it might actually be beneficial. SC is, like, the most beneficial for me to gather more NI data. Like, to, I really need to do, like, I need to be, I need to push myself to do more SE activities. But not SE activities that get me in a flow state. Like, not something like running, because that tends to get you like into an NI state, but something that's like super hands-on where you can't think about anything else but the activity. So like, I don't know, like doing the dishes or laundry or cleaning the car. That, I love, that stuff is like the best, like just hands-on in the moment, immersive that um, allows my NI to just take a break. Love that. We had a lot of questions actually about inferior SE for NI DOMS. Okay. If you were to if you were to talk to INTJs, what do you think is a help? Because I think in the community, there's a lot of understanding that you have to develop that lower function, but that means different things to different people. What would be your advice to INTJs in how to view that inferior SE or an attitude towards that inferior SE? I think I would just say it's simply put as a growth path. To, you, you will you will never be disappointed that you did an SE activity. Like something, you know, like if someone said like, let's go kayaking or let's go white water rafting. Let's get right in there. And like, you have to, I mean, that's the thing where you, you, it's like a survival, it's something where it's like your survival is at stake and you're just like parachute jumping, skydiving. To me, that's like the ultimate SE activity. That's beneficial to us. So embracing that will lead to something. I can't tell, I can't say like, will lead to X, X, but it will lead to you being like, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I, mm. I should do that more. Yeah, awesome. Good advice. Question five, what fictional character do you most identify with? Oh, man, the first one that comes to mind is Tommy Shelby from Peaky Blinders. Oh, I don't know that show. Okay. Could, you t could you tell us about him? It's, a, it's like a 1913 Birmingham, in Birmingham, England. He is the head of a, like, English gang. And he's just like, he's just a ruthless INTJ planner, schemer, strategist. And I just, I like, I, I like his like tragic brooding, <laughs> but I don't feel like that's me, but I like, it's like, if I was like that, I would want to be him. Is he the guy who wears those, like, he has a, does he have a very distinctive haircut? Oh yeah. I got, this is my haircut. When I go, I say, give me the Tommy Shelby. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Guys, you can't you can't see Joe right now, but he has a perfect haircut, <laughs> and his hair is his hair is always on point. Yeah, but uh, it's funny because my barber says when that show came out, literally people would walk in and say, "I want the guy from Peaky Blinders." So wow. INTJs will get Gosh. it. Yeah, and does he wear like trench coats and stuff? And berets, yeah. Love a good beret. Oh yeah. All right, next question. Topical. Why are you so attractive and intelligent? You know, God delivered, I just signed for it. You know? <laughs> Did you practice that answer? Well, it's actually a line I stole from another INTJ, Stewie, from Family Guy. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, Stewie would be an INTJ, wouldn't he? No, oh, he's old. He's one of the best examples. I've heard, actually, this is not a question that's written down. It's just come to me. I've heard that Patrick Starr is an INTJ. Well, I've seen him as ISTP on the internet. I don't understand how he could be INTJ. Isn't he, I, like, I don't recall. I haven't watched Spongebob in years. But isn't he, like, kind of, like, his, his character is, like, stereotypically dumb? I think I've, I've never watched the show. <laughs> You'll just claim it. Okay. No, I All mean, right. I, I've seen him. I've seen his, um, when I was doing research for my some of my posters and stuff that I saw on Etsy, I was like looking at ISTPs and Patrick comes up as like one of the best examples. Patrick and Shrek. Oh, yeah. Shrek. Yeah, I see Shrek as, I, I see Shrek as an ISTP for sure. What are some other famous INTJs? <laughs> uh, well, Elon's a good example. Mm -hmm. There's a 
audience can't see it, but I have a small bronze bust of Nietzsche is a very good example of INTJ. Mm. Tesla is a very good example of INTJ. I'm trying to think like who who exists like right now in in the world. Oh my gosh, I'm losing it. But yeah, those those like I mean Tesla. I think Tesla's the best example if I were to pick one, because he has this great quote that says like, "My brain is a receiver, and I just receive signals from the universe." to understand it wow. and i'm like that is an end like oh. he didn't even know what he was saying but he was like that's mm-hmm. what and I, like i don't have information the universe gives it to me and i'm still trying to understand the core of it i'm like oh my god just gosh yeah so many people would not identify with that quote and that is exactly what you refer to in like type is a thing that's happening to us whether you deny it or not yeah <laughs> man that's, i feel like that's to me that seems like come on people you've had that like flash of brilliance from nowhere and you ran with it and you were so certain that it was you could trust it and they're like i guess and so i'm like i, I don't know yeah well no 100 mm-hmm. percent. now how does one get on your good side from an enfp asking because i'm not sure where the line of annoying is oh just like whatever we're talking about embracing like carrying on or being able to stay open-minded about a topic that you don't know a lot about or you're just like asking me to go on okay well tell me more about that what does that mean oh okay so engaging with it but not being like intellectually stunted on something like having a very like binary view of of things Uh, that's why i like to troll people with questions about like i usually will bring up flat earth if i'm trying to get a rise out of somebody and if they're willing to go, okay, let's talk about it. I don't agree, but like, let's go there. That's a person that I can say is intellectually elite. Like they have a mind that can, while holding a thought, they while holding a discussion they don't agree with, still having it. So how do you find when you're talking to those any doms who want to take what you're giving them and sort of use that as a springboard to go on to other things? So what? So is that the actual question? Is that the question? No, that's that's me taking the fact that this was asked by an ENFP to ask specifically. Interestingly, how do you find talking to NE users when you want to sort of deep dive into something and they might like get tangented or interrupt you or whatever it is? Generalizing here. Yeah, I, I it's endearing to a degree, but I almost want to say like at a point I'm just like, tell me what you actually believe. Like, don't, like, because the natural inclination is to go, I say an idea, and they go, oh, or, oh, possibly, and like, no, no, not, just, yeah. like, actually, you agree with me, so don't give me the alternative, but I know we're on the same page, so it's like yeah. a, but if they don't know their NE, they think they're adding, they always think they're adding value, but sometimes they're just adding confusion to the mix, and they're making, mm. they're muddling a plan that we have that's going. And they're just like, well, what, mm. maybe we could. I actually feel like my wife, who's an ISTJ, will sometimes dip into her NE accidentally and go, like, while we're doing something, suggest an alternative. That's like, why are you doing this? Why? <laughs> we're already doing something. Like, we don't something. need an alternative. <laughs> and I'm, she's like, I'm sorry, I'm NEing. I'm NEing. My bad. And she will apologize. <laughs> And you're like, that's right. Yeah. Apologize for your NE. Mm-hmm. Bow down. No. Yes. <laughs> I definitely see that. It's one of the easiest differences for me to tell in deep or long conversations is the N-I-N-E difference between someone, whether mm. someone's using N-I or N-E. How do you um, distinguish it? And also, I have a two-part question, so I'm going to ask you as the host because I have a really interesting question. I'm sorry. Question, you're so. my guest. No, I'm just kidding. Go. <laughs> no. How do you determine N-I versus N-E in a conversation? Like, as an N-I user... I don't know how to tell who's an NI user. NE is the most glaringly obvious, but NI, I'm like, I don't know. How do you tell? Mm. I've found personally that no matter where it is in the stack, definitely if it's in the first two, especially if it's in the first slot, but first two slots, NI will listen intently without uh, interrupting. I am speaking generally here, disclaimer, generalizations, right? Generally speaking. They will listen intently, less interruptions, and will ask pointed questions to understand what you mean to get the to get the full picture of the point you're trying to make or the thing you're trying to talk about. In the third and fourth slots, I have seen that still come out. I know I use NI myself, and I absolutely can hyper focus in a deep conversation when it's about something that I personally like care about. Mm-hmm. So if you were to talk to me about like yeah religion or my faith or something, I could hyper focus there or 
I, if I'd want to understand your perspective, I would listen intently. I'd ask pointed questions, but it just means because it's a lower slot for me. I'm not going to as often be interested in just anything, right? Right. But with NE users, it's it's the jumping, it's the lack of attachment to those ideas that they're talking about. It's It could be this, it could be this, it could be that. But any users who I think like care about you or like are, especially if they're aware that NE, um, hmm. like my, my sister, my sister doesn't do that nearly as much as like she used to so well, it's a, like not a bad thing but. so your sister's an ENFP um yeah so I have a question so and I have not asked this before with uh, with your type specifically but what does NE look like as an eighth slot I find I just think it doesn't even exist in my world because the amount of times I have an ENTP and ENFP siblings that mm. are both types and they just will just NE for so long. Just here's an idea, here's an idea. Oh, here's this other cool idea. Oh, but what if this? And the amount of times my brain is just going, but what's the point? But why? Why? Like, which are you sticking with? Which one are we discussing? Which one are we getting to the meat of? You know? And I, I, I very rarely have had a situation where it's like just novel to sort of, unless I'm like getting to know someone, but then it's more like my FI loving the idea of getting to know them as a person and affirming them in whatever their journey is. I don't I don't know if it's NE like interested in all their different ideas that they have to show me. That's just because I care about them or want to get to know them. So I don't know if it plays a role in my life whatsoever. I'm not sure where I sit on the shadow functions. Um, it's very hard because I think I'm an SE dom. I need observable data to be able to inform my patterns. And because I can't observe shadow functions as easy right. as the other ones. It's harder for me to sort of get my head around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's much uh, debate about whether they exist or whether it's even important to focus on them if you can. And I just like, ace slot's always interesting because I'm like, what is like, you know, what is for an ISTJ, I know that NI for my wife is, is something that is very scary and or you don't see, it's like hardly ever, use or articulated so i'm like what is i always like to ask about that like it's so hidden like do you even notice when you're using it i think maybe we can d describe those those bottom slots like seventh and eighth in terms of like not how we use it but maybe our attitude towards it so for i definitely notice a difference between how i understand ti and and ne mm. like if ti is you know my polar my trickster function or whatever yeah i did really don't understand ti like i just don't understand it me neither like, at all and i am kind of somewhat intimidated almost even like scared by it mm -hmm. um but, and then other times annoyed by it when i see someone using it in a in a way that i would decipher as stubborn or something oh. i'm kind of like why like oh where are your where are your beliefs like where are your core values blah, blah blah or whatever it is um love you ti users with with ne it's like okay i recognize what it is i understand it because it's like literally what i do with sense data is what they're doing with ideas and because mm -hmm. i really love the idea of being able to free to frolic be free to frolic in yeah. the sense data i can respect that they need to be free to frolic in their ideas like whatever i get it like you that's fine you do yep. you with your ne so I, I know it's a thing. I kind of understand it and I'm just happy for, I'm happy to be around it, but it's not like that fundamental, I don't understand you kind of thing, you know, yep. as opposed to TI. What is your coping mechanism for existential crises slash nihilism? I, I don't think I've had really existential crises or nihilism in a while. And I think I kind of articulate this point in my book about um, stagnation and or complacency in like just things were good but thing, things weren't good things weren't bad you're just like this plateau of like being comfortable which for me as an INTJ was bad because that means I'm not building anything um mm. coping mechanism is to create something so either it's like something as basic as art like you know some creative endeavor like make a new Etsy poster or make a new shirt or write a book that's the way to escape oh, it, that. is to do something, it's, once again, it's like SE, like, start generating some action towards a thing. Oh, I love that. That's a great answer. Are you evil? How do you feel about that stereotype? I think it's much more capable in INTJ. Like, you can, you could, like, I have these thoughts all the time, and I'm sure I'm, I cannot be the only one that has it, but, like, you're driving down the road, and someone's walking on the street. You could easily hit them. But you have the capacity mm -hmm. to know, like, I'm not going to do that because I'm not a psychopath. But you could, and you'd be like, it would almost be like, oh, I hit that person. I could see an INTJ just being like, that's it. Like, viewing people, like, detaching from the, the 
from people or the impact they have on people and mm. and not and be becoming like a real sick person but having the least amount of like being able to compartmentalize it very easily mm. like live a completely normal life while also like being a serial killer yeah wow yeah. so you think there's a there's there's an element of truth to it i think so for sure how does n-i-t-e differ behaviorally from e-n-t-j's t-e-n-i um behaviorally i think just in discernment you know, just the capacity to just go, hold on, like, let's more contemplative of how we're going to approach the thing. And I, I mean, it could be as, as simple as like taking one more day to make a decision or a plan of action than just like, you know, going right ahead and then kind of contemplating repercussions as you're going. Um, I always kind of think like in a business setting, like if, you know, you're going to create a project that the ENTJ would immediately start kind of okay we need this and this this much money and i got to talk to this person the intj would be like take a little bit more time and discernment to do the thing but but not have as much um i don't know i i hate I use the word energy but that te energy is very clear if they're mm. if the types are real but i don't know if that answers the behavioral question like behaviorally yeah i don't know i don't know if that's a good yeah. answer behavior is hard to hard, i like hard it to because answer. i'm I'm getting into that behavioral stuff. I've, I'm, I got a, you know, voltology, right? Have you heard of voltology? No. In the, it's a, it's a movement within, uh, I, I wouldn't call it in thin type, but it's basically typing you by your expressions and the way that your affect, like me doing this is a, uh, voltology is a study uh, yeah. of the face and how you, the gestures uh, and yeah. stuff like that. I've been, mm. I've done a, a voltology um, session and I, really into like how behavior comes out in type mm. yeah i've definitely looked into that i didn't know that was what it was called mm -hmm. but i think there's something to that for sure mm -hmm. do you consider yourself to be more of a cynical person or an idealistic person i actually would say realistically more on the idealistic side i think there's in the same way that nfs have like a a more idealism towards like this mural as portrait they paint in their heads about things i still think nts have like a very um, they think of themselves to quote like Michael Pierce as a monarch. They think of themselves as very grand and they, they all have a crown on and they're the, the best and they idealize their accomplishments or their ability to accomplish things that are not actually in reality. Or they have yeah. an idea of like, eventually I'll be famous and rich and powerful. What are some things that, that are likely to make you emotional? I like, I well I will definitely watch some YouTube videos just to get those feels and, but to like come out of me but like i think uh videos where like loved ones will surprise the other person like coming like Aww. military coming coming home surprising i'm like oh god here it comes here come the waterworks <laughs> and uh, so yeah, that, that sort of stuff where it's like just grand gestures that have no you know for not not for fame or money just for like pure love of the person that that stuff gets me mm. oh wholesome yeah Dating advice for INTJs, especially female. This was asked by a female. Mm, gosh, that's a oh, man. Broad question. Dating. Oh man, I'm trying be to be yourself. Be great, yeah. I think like it, if you can be snarky and have a sense of humor, will go a long way with 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 men. So just be interesting. Being interesting goes way farther than being like just totally attractive. So. Don't get caught up in being attractive. You be caught up in being like intimidatingly smart. If you are, if you're not, don't try to be. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You're like Kristen, please. All INTJs are smart. It's true. If you could be another type for a day, which type would you be? Well, I'm always jealous of the ENTJs. But that's kind of too easy of an answer, so I'm not going to go with that one. I that's think... unpackable. What? That's unpackable. Why? Why you're Why you're jealous of ENTJs? Well, let me answer the question, but I can go back to that. I would say, honestly, I think ESFP would be interesting because I, I, I admire the creativity of the ESFPs and I, I've i come around to them being a, as a type that I respect, like on, in the in the hierarchy of who I respect and don't respect. <laughs> They're up there. They're definitely top 16. I, I think we're all intrigued to hear about that list. Well, <laughs> I'm, joking, I'm actually... My, so I've already started writing book two, 
And there's, oh, of course. there's going to be a section on the hierarchy of type. So I, you'll get I love that. Joe's like somewhat tongue in cheek, but like I do think there might exist a hierarchy. I so want to ask more about that. Like hierarchy in your own mind in or in general? Well, I think I'm going to take it from a Western point of view and I might take it from a beneficial to society. And I'll try to make the argument that there are certain types that are more beneficial to progress. Like I'll have to define it as uh. like, I define hierarchy as progress and helping society go forward. And I could probably mm. make arguments for why certain types, you know, are not, the best at that mm, yeah i see i see what you're trying to do makes sense mm -hmm. and just quickly why are you jealous of the entj they make the most money statistically there's been that, that like, since the beginning of time entjs have always made the most money i don't know i just think that they're the most capable type mm. of all the types like okay the most like i i work with nfps and i see their inability to push through stuff they don't want to do like they can do it for the first day maybe the first week but eventually that if it if it clashes with their fi they will not do it entjs mm. and those that can kind of bury their their si can just push through grinding horrible tasks for the end goal no matter what wow yeah okay fair um, enough yeah interesting perspective that actually was a good segue into the next question. How does being around your opposite type, ESFP, challenge or inspire you? I didn't ask this question, I promise. Okay. <laughs> well, I was watching Amy Y today, um, and you two have a similar style of editing and creativity that I'm that I would like. I get ins it inspires me to be like I can do so much more with my videos. I can do so much more with my graphics, and and that, that I recognize that as like. I'm always thinking like, should I just hire them? Like, I'll hire them. They, they just like, I'll send them. They just do whatever they want, and like, I trust them. And but they, you, your type inspires me to, like, I know there's more capacity, because I'm sure if I was shown how to do this, I would do it, and I'd be like, oh, that's another like tool in my tool belt. Like, that's awesome. Love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love how the way we inspire you is to do with like, work, <laughs> like bettering yourself, yes. hitting the goal better. Like, yes. <laughs> Would it inspire you because of how emotionally expressive we are? <laughs> is it mostly <laughs> serious pondering face? <laughs> I mean, but your FI is only one one slot above mine, so it's not like you're, you know, true exponentially more expressive. Mm. It could be a male female yeah, dichotomy too. Yeah, true. But expressive is because it's coming out into the physical world. That could be our SE dominant slot. Like bringing the FI into the physical world, right? So we're yeah. better at doing that. Yeah, I, I would never do a video on like um, the power of apology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like yep, you wouldn't fair. catch me doing that, but I I, I, I see the value I would in you pay doing it. money to see you do that. Although you would just be tongue in cheek the whole time. You'd just be making jokes the whole time. Right. So I mean, it'd it, be satire. <laughs> I could really pull some real like classic Joe examples of where my FE really screwed up and why the apology fixed it. And I could, I could pull something mm. out. Yeah. No, I, I trust that. What are INTJ stereotypes you personally don't relate to? Being logical. Like I, bec like I am not logical. Like being a perceiving type means I do, like I am not, like NI does not have any sense of being in like a box of, a equals B equals C. That's why I'm jealous of TI types um, because they, they have, quote, that logic, that function, but mine is hidden. I'm jealous of it. I'm scared of it. I'm annoyed by it. So I don't think INTJs are logical. I did, in my INTJ video, like the first real video that made that had any traction, it's the INTJ at work that I did. And all the responses from INTJs that are negative are like, no, every email that I send is perfectly written. I'm like, I send emails with like, just I type it and send, and I'm like, oh wow, that was horrible. So I don't this detail <laughs> thing with INTJs. I don't see it that often. They 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 claim they are, but I don't think we are. Good point. Very honest. What was the biggest misconception that people had about you growing up? I have no idea. Literally, can I have like huge question. brainwave just went like flatlined. Like I, I don't know. Good. 
That's Joe a hard says, one Great to question. He needs to ponder on that. Yep. He'll come back to you with his answer later in the comments. In the comments of this podcast. He'll send me his answer and I'll publish it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Do you call out people when they assume INTJs feel nothing? Or is the cost of vulnerability too high? No, I think it's great. I am okay being vulnerable and I'm okay... I think that's like a growth path of mine that I've, I've pushed myself to, to do, like to tell people like, I love you. I've said that to you. I'm pretty Aww. sure I've typed it to you before. Yeah. And I'm I like, that. that's like not weird. Like, I'm like, that's good. That's positive, And that's not wrong. And yeah, um, I said that to more and more people that are my friends that are close mm-hmm. to me. And I'm like, this is something that I, s- it feels awkward to say, but I want to say it so bad. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think you have a really healthy attitude towards not just type, but vulnerability as well. It's one of the reasons I appreciate you as a person. Oh. So thank you. Thank you for your for sharing your heart with the world, Joe. Okay, yeah. we're taking it too far now. <laughs> we might get through all the questions. Okay, we're going to try power these out. Do you trust your friends with telling them your life plans? Oh, life plans? Totally, yes. And this is like a... This has sort of been a, a an internal annoyance of mine, but... I feel like what I'm doing is interesting. And I'm like, you know, I've to- told some people that I wrote the book and they're like, that's cool. And I'm like, I thought you'd be more impressed by that. You know, and I'm like, so when I tell them I'm writing a book and I'm kind of, I'm doing this, uh, you know, I'm signing a contract and oh, I'm doing this podcast and oh, I'm having so-and-so. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, nice. And I'm like, am I not that interesting or should I be doing something different or so there's like, You're like when... sorry can we make this about me for a second <laughs> and my achievements hello FI <laughs> it, it, sort of it sort of comes out and I'm like and I want to yell at people and be like N- tell me what tell me what you're doing how interesting are you what'd you do today tell me the thoughts you had <laughs> go no I'm, I have all the time all the time in the world and I and I think that this dialogue goes on in my head and I'm like oh well I'm sorry like what did you create today I'm like, oh, I didn't mm. have time. Okay, you didn't have time. Well, all right. And so mm. I immediately get angry well, when people... I go... created a book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like the arrogance of writing a book. It's just like... Um, but I think it's my fault too. So INT... like a lot of INTJs will resonate with this. When people ask you generic questions like, how's it going? You say, yeah, it's going. Good. You ask other types of questions, they will just tell you what's going on. So you know about them. They tell you everything. They and it's like, well, we should take a little bit of that. Like, it's okay to tell people what you're doing without imposing on them. Take a page mm-hmm. out of the extroverts a little bit and just say, like, you can tell people, like, oh man, today I had this experience and it was crazy. What do you think about that? We're just like, ah, they don't want to hear it. So we never share and we're mad that like suddenly like we're mad that we didn't get to share, but we never offered to share. And then when people asked us to share, we said, oh yeah, no, good day. It was, today's fine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I find with small talk questions, every time someone asks me a small talk question, like, how have you been? I want to dive into, like, the latest discoveries I've had on myself or the latest epiphanies I've had about life. They're like, oh, no, I just mean, oh, like, but I meant, like, what did you do on the weekend? I'm like, but that doesn't matter (laughs) what I did. I've forgotten what I've done. Exactly. On that topic, the, the new question I'm asking people is, what are you building instead of how are you doing? I love that. What if someone isn't building something, though? Then I then I want them around me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I feel like all all types would interpret that differently, but I feel like everyone should have an answer for that, or will have if they look deep enough. Yeah. Assuming that you do, why do you prefer to focus on the future rather than the present moment? Why do I decide to focus on the future rather than the present moment? Why do prefer I prefer to? Why do I? Because hmm. it's because it's just your functions. You can't help it. I guess it's just the functions. I guess now doesn't seem like you know, now now is a means to an end. I I guess it's a I mean it's a, it's a, such a straightforward question. It's sort of like asking like a like a math genius of basic algebra, and they're like, I don't even know how to answer this anymore. Like I'm so far removed from that that it doesn't like a basic question. I just fall flat yeah. on my face. But it's a good question. Mm. So why do like I don't think I think it's too much of a cop out just to say oh it's just my functions. Okay, well, that's a, that's probably the best question so far. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. Done with your answer? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about it. It's like, well, why is it a good question? It's because it's, um, 
it's like, so wh why do you, why do you do what you do? And then it's like, well, I mean, I, I don't really know why. It's just kind of like, I've always done it for 32 years and then, mm -hmm. but I've never thought about it running on autopilot and then being like, why is your autopilot that way? And you're like, I, <laughs> nah, yeah, <laughs> nah, lost me. Yep. Yeah. Someone asked that about my SE. I, I, I would have the same answer. I'd be like, there's no other way to do, there's no other way to be. <laughs> Are there people that don't live right now? What are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> that was my whole thing with type when I realized that there were people who didn't. I was like, what? There are people who don't live in the here right now? There's another way? What? That blew my mind when I realized that. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Do you have any advice about you? how you as an INTJ have learned how to resolve conflict? I love to get out in front of an apology or get out in front of an um, impending conflict because if, you if you're NI you know what is likely going to happen with, with if you do something that is negative like you know you know steal someone's girlfriend you know the consequences so you got to you you know how it's going to end so like you can anticipate it, it's like it's like pr like get out in front of the conflict before like it blows up in your face and just apologize and say it's my fault i'm totally good with saying i i messed up like you know what that was me i own it I understand you're mad and um, you should be. Yeah. Do you find that there's a place for, how do you go about validating the other person's experience or feelings when they've, when you've hurt them or upset them or something? I think, I, I think I'm not good at that. I think what a lot of people do is like, try to like, Hey, that happened to me. I had this friend do this exact same thing. and I was so upset. I feel like that's pandering, but apparently I th it, it's probably a good way to, or it's condescending mm -hmm. or it's like, hey, I understand why you're upset because this happened to me. And then you're focusing it back on yourself mm -hmm. again, which is yeah. not a good way to do it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't have – I definitely I, don't have advice for that. What, do you have some advice? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, I have a whole video on that. So if you're interested in that topic, please go check that one out. But I think even you just <laughs> – you're like, of course. I think even you just saying, oh, sorry, yeah, like I messed up. That's on me. I understand why that would upset you would literally be fine. The words mm. I – I'm sorry, are so powerful and validating in and of themselves in a lot of cases, especially when there's a lot of love in the relationship already. So mm -hmm. yeah, but there's a video on both of those topics. If you guys are interested, go to my YouTube channel if you're interested. What are some personality quirks in others that make you feel at ease and some that annoy you? Make me feel at ease. Personality quirks. Or traits, maybe. I think FE, like strong FE users that use it well, um, allow me room to make mistakes or uh are very forgiving like you know oh yeah i get that even if they disagree they're very like they're not wanting to upset you by like saying that what they did what you did made them upset i don't know they tend to get run over by my type or other types but i don't know that's a, another good question that i've never thought about what was the second part of that question <laughs> uh some personality quirks or traits that annoy you versus ones that put you at ease. I think the any, uh, back to the any thing is really annoying. Oh, I was actually commenting on something that Amy Y was talking about today with TI. I'm always like jealous of TI. And then also I'm like, and so what? Cause TI is not going to do anything with it. They're just going to be happy that they figured <laughs> it out. So I'm like, yeah. So genius without, without action is, is worthless to me. So like if you have the TI and then you use the TI to do something with, you use TE and TI together, that's powerful. But TI by itself is just smart without a direction. So I'm like, okay, yeah, you're smarter than me. So interesting. So would you say it annoys you when people think they're smarter than you? There are definitely people that are smarter than me and more accomplished and, and, when they, I respect them because I'm like, man, I can, I want to be on your level. But when I don't see results of genius, it makes me sad and upset because I'm like, you're wasting. Like I, I commented, TI wastes its genius on just itself. Like being internally smart, they don't do anything to build off it. So, um, mm, interesting. They're definitely INTPs and ISTPs that are just like whip smart, but then they have like the most like they can't get out of their own way. Any TI users listening right now, consider this your wake up call from Joe to get up and uh, go do something. <laughs> That's like literally not at all what I'm saying. I'm just like, if I had your, if you could give me the TI, then I would go do something with it and be like, we're going to conquer use it. stuff right now. We're going to do. So maybe what annoys you is wasted potential. 
Yes, I think that's a tragedy because, like, that's why, and I write in the book, like, that's why I stopped watching sports because that's a waste of your life and potential. And you, a lot of TI users are really good at memorizing um, fantasy sports and football, and they have all these, they have a huge data bank of, like, uh, um, music that they know, they know every album and cover and title of every track, but they, that's useless. A lot of people would feel that you're down to earth, but do you feel like you're superior to everyone? Not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a natural um, aristocracy or aristocratic mm -hmm. nature of the INTJ that from the beginning, it's like, I don't think this person is smart until they prove me wrong. And then they're in like, I, I want to hear everything about this person. I, like, I want to pick their brain so that I can learn from them. Nice. We have a few more questions, and I just want to see if we can maybe do this with, like, really quick answers. Let's go. Because um, I do want to ask them all. What qualities do you value in people close to you? Loyalty and um, intelligence. Do you think free will exists? <laughs> do I think free will <laughs> exists? Yes. How do people find out if they use N-I or N-E as their dominant function? Yeah, I had to ask you that question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there's a what? good way. Well, any is very expressive. Any is verbal. And any is very, um, like, any is more tangible. But I don't yeah. know how to tell you, like, if there's ni. So you have to work backwards towards it, I guess. Mm. Familiarize yourself with the functions. Read Joe's book. Talk to people who are close to you who know you better than you know. Well, who know how you present externally better than you do. What is your least favorite thing about being an INTJ? Being nervous about, like, a approaching new people networking um it's just awkwardness in like situations where you have to greet people it's like do a hug is it a fist bump is it like all these like weird things that you stress out about you pre-stress about it wow. and they're so mundane but other people are so natural at it like i i, I the that social awkwardness or just the not even me social awkward just f that anxiety around social uh, social situations I hate. I also um, don't think INTJs are very good public speakers, even though some, some are. Mm. Um, I get so nervous about public speaking presentations and stuff like that. Wow, yeah, that NI. It sounds like all of those answers, your NI is getting ahead of you. Like, what could happen? This is something that I'm stewing over. I don't relate to any of those. I just engage mm -hmm. perpetually. <laughs> um, do you find other INTJs easy to connect with? Oh, actually, I, I don't. I actually have recently discovered that there's very few INTJs that I think I understand what they're saying or agree with them at all. What are some other types you find easy to connect with? Well, I love ENTPs to death. Love working with them. Business partners, they're just, they're so solid and they're, they are so genius. They're so smart. And I really... I think I would really like an ISFP. Like they're still in the same quadra. They're still part of the monarch monarch um, temperament. But um, ESFP, ISFP, probably um, INFJs. I tend to have like a really good initial start to my relations with, relationships with them. But um, the inevitable T E F E clashing just ends up like f it fades away. Mm. Interesting. Oh, there's so many questions I want to dive deeper into. We have like, how many more? One, two, three, five. Yeah. How does your decision-making process go? How do you decide which decisions are the right ones? I think there is a level of SI experience being like, okay, I've seen this, you know, I've seen this before. We're, this is the right way to do it. Um, there is definitely a gut feeling. I don't, and the gut feeling, it's hard to tell if it's NI working or if it's, if it's FI principles working. So, um it is one, it's either NI or FI um, immediately coming to a, a decision, like instantly, for better or worse. And then you usually take the, that longer time to decide, though, than an ENTJ. Totally. What's happening in that process? Um, just like, you know, plan out the scenarios, all the different paths, the divergent paths that could, that could happen. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like hard to describe a thought process. And that's, there's like a very specific example of how would you solve this? It's hard for me to describe it. It's just a feeling. It's something, you know, mm -hmm. it's the universe telling you. 
I totally resonate with that so much, and and that's why that's how I know as an NI Dom because when I read that, I said, I that's the that's that flash of the universe telling you something. That's the archetypal images that come to you when you dream, and you're like, what was that about? It's something. Don't know, but wow. I'm in, I'm in concert with it. So let's do like we have to take it and go somewhere. <laughs> but if you don't know your NI, then you just dismiss it. You go, oh, that's stupid. Uh, mm. Value of knowing type, ladies and gentlemen. How do you experience emotions? As a highly analytical type, are they an afterthought? Stressful? Unhelpful? Oh, not an afterthought at all. Very stressful. Immediately changes my mood. Like it's, I'm not able to, you know, smile, grin and bear it, whatever you want to say, like push through it especially when it's a major interruption into my flow it is like i cannot come back from it it's like i have mm. to like decompress for a long time to to come back to level and it's definitely like something my wife will be like will notice an immediate change in in attitude and tone and like short responses i've never understood ni could you explain the process of it we've kind of touched on this i call myself a <laughs> type expert and like i don't know freaking no. figure it out <laughs> <laughs> you've touched on many ways of answering this though it's like something that comes to you in a dream or something that you just feel or something you just intuitively know well it's like it it, it tends to be like i think uh, you know I'm, I'm better at stealing quotes from people because they've always said it better but like you know newton said that no great discovery is made without a, a, a bold guess and I feel like NI is a very good guesser of mm. an outcome or a, this is what's going to happen. I'm telling you, I mean, I said it and they're like, oh my gosh. Or like, you're just like, you know, random pieces of trivia that you might know that you don't actually know, but you've random pieces in your head, semi connected the dots out there in the 5D. And you're just like, and you say it and they're like, what, how did you? And you're like, I don't know, but it's, I felt, I felt right. Why are INTJs so fixated on material goals slash wealth? I found this question interesting because since I've known you from the early days, you were like, Kristen, it's not about the money. Like you've said that so many times, it's not about the money. But literally in this podcast, you've said, I want to be an ENTJ because they're so good at making money. Yeah, I did say that. And that's one of the, you know, one of the stereotypes about INTJs that's real is that we contradict ourselves totally in the same, like, sentence or discussion will literally say something against what we just said i think it does have to do with in our society intelligence leading to wealth so if i have wealth i'm smart and if i don't have wealth i'm an idiot and people that don't have stuff are idiots and i don't want to be one of those people because i'm above those people so right. it's, it, it actually tends to be um uh a very logical sequence of like if poor then dumb <laughs> <laughs> and I am not dumb, thus I if I don't see success, I need to get it. It need I need to have success. So it's actually not the material goods in and of themselves, but something greater that they signify. Yeah, I'm I'm sure if there was another currency that we could get, like if the ultimate goal was to have the most amount of friends, I'd be going after a, you know, I'd be holding a party every day to get friends. Oh. You know what I mean? So I think it's just a it's a validating way to know that you're doing something right or doing something societally acceptable. I don't know. Mm. And the last question that we have today, someone's just asked, how are you? Brackets, intellectually, in personal life, professional life, and emotional life. Go. Oh, great, great question. Intellectually, I really feel sharper than ever. I'm reading a ton of really interesting books, and I'm like really branching out into some stuff that's really tough to read, but it's like good for the you know mental flexing. So intellectually, then what was it? Professional. Professional. Yeah, I had an interview today for a role that I really want. Like, usually I come with the attitude like, Psh, you know, I don't even, like, if they want me, like, I don't need them. But at the end of the interview, it's like, I really hope they hire me. Uh, <laughs> they'd be so, lucky to have you. Professionally, I'm doing fine. Yeah, thank you. That means that I should, you can do a reference for me. A reference letter. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Um, and then the, spiritually was the next one. Did you mention your book in the interview out of interest? Did I? You mentioned it. No, sorry. In the job interview. Oh, in the job interview. Um, I did. I brought it with me. And I, I said, <laughs> hey, this is like what I... Because they saw my resume. Like I literally have my business and MBTI coach. And they were like, oh, 
interesting. Like, what what do all the letters mean? So I was like, uh, just, I don't have time for that. That's Aww. a whole different thing. But no. um, they were like, how do you have time to do a book and work full time? It's like, I don't need that much sleep. And, you know, I just, when I had my son, I was just like very motivated to like do stuff almost on his behalf. Like I got a that's also like I'm obligated for success now. There's no like, mm. you know, now the life really starts. You got to start like mm. being responsible for something else. Wow. So, yeah. I love that. That segues into the personal and emotional life, which were the last two parts of that question. Okay. Personal life has been really good. Um, the last year we moved from California to Tennessee, made a lot of really good friends, and we've been able to pick our friends in the sense that we were like very cautious about who we let in the inner circle, and it's been great. We have some extremely um, awesome people that are like babysit, and you know they're just really wholesome, you know, salt of the earth people. And um, mm-hmm. what was it? Emo- what was the last one? Emotional. Emotional. I think the tiredness has affected my emotions, like just the 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 you know. 1 a.m. feeding, then the 4 a.m. feeding, then the 8 a.m. feeding, yeah, yeah. all that stuff, it, it like, wears mm-hmm. down. So, like, you're, I'm very, I get angrier easier mm-hmm. because I'm just, like, my schedule's off and that's that sort of stuff. So, Well, I'm sure the work you've been doing on getting to know yourself in self-development and type has helped to know your weaknesses and strengths at this time. It has. I sometimes forget, and that's a lot ongoing battle. But uh, Yeah, you're human. Yeah, that's disappointing. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for having me and letting me uh, just just talk about <laughs> NI and I issues in my book and and uh, really good you know your audience is uh, has good questions and and I really have to ponder some of these like I'll, as I sleep tonight I'm sure I'll have like visions of like oh I I really need to answer this question because if I don't have an answer for this like you know, someone else could ask it and it could be a, like, it's, it's a very good question. So thank you to your audience for really good questions. Yeah, we had, we had many more questions. Um, I'm always really thankful to the, to the followers on my Instagram for giving me the questions. They're really thought provoking questions. So thank you for submitting them to, to the audience. Thank you so much, Joe, for coming on the podcast. How is your podcast going? It's going well. I think, um, I mean, I have like, I think like 5,000 downloads. So, yeah, it's good. That's really mm. good. Great trajectory. That's it's yeah. hard to like I feel like it's hard to get a podcast off the ground. So, um mm. if you're continuing to do it, I think that means there's some return. So that that that's that's good and I'm honored to be here. Yeah. It's it's definitely awesome to be able to have these more real conversations about type as opposed to just the comedy sketches I release every week which can only go so far, you know. Um, so I've, I, I've personally, I've realized that I personally feel a bit more fulfilled in what I'm doing and I feel like I have a more holistic life at the moment in terms of balance of those intellectual pursuits and the creative pursuits right now, because since doing the podcast and a few other things that I've been doing, like engaging more actively with the Patreon and all that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great journey and I am loving it. So yeah, very glad that I could have you on the podcast. Uh, just to remind you all, go follow Joe on YouTube at Ghost of Young. He has his book out now, which you can go find on Etsy. Please do so. Um, anything else you'd like to say? I don't think, I think I'm pretty well spent. This is a lot of talking for INTJ, but um, <laughs> no, and just thankful for you, um, for our connection. I really think we should do, I mean, I think I said this last time, we should definitely do a podcast together. I'd probably have to, you know, produce it, but, um, cause you have your own, but I really think th- this ESFP INTJ connection is, is, is needs to be broadcast to, to the masses. Yeah. I love it. I love that we bring such different takes on things as well. Like so much of what you said in this, this interview was stuff I couldn't relate to, but could like kind of relate to, cause you were tapping into something that's part of my personality, but I don't access very often. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I find my relationship with INTJs is, is usually quite easy, but definitely with you, like you, it's always been easy, Joe. So absolute pleasure chatting to you. Um, go buy marble and sculpt everyone and I'll chat to you next time. And so will Joe. Bye. Bye. And that's a wrap on our first INTJ interview of the podcast. It's always great fun talking to Joe, just in regards to the question he was unable to answer, that being, what is the biggest misconception people had about you growing up? 
I did chase him up on his answer and he wrote to me that the biggest misconception that people had about him growing up was that he was confident. He wrote, people thought I was confident because I'd always shoot my shot with girls and try to flirt, but was super nervous and anxious, but I had to be bold at the same time. So consider all of the questions answered, ladies and gentlemen, and that makes the first guest who answered all of the designated questions, technically. And sorry, Laith, for rubbing salt in that wound, if you're listening. Thanks so much for listening to the episode, guys. I always appreciate you tuning in and the feedback that you give me. You all rule, every single one of you. If you like this episode, please consider following the podcast. And if you're on a podcast platform that allows ratings, I'd sure appreciate it if you, if you could leave. Can you hear those trucks in the background? There's so many trucks in the background and I'm just wondering if they're making it into the audio. If you're on a podcast platform that allows ratings, I'd sure appreciate it if you could leave a rating. Don't forget to check out Joe's book, Marble and Sculptor. I've put links to where you can buy it as well as Joe's YouTube channel and LinkedIn page in the show notes for this episode. If you're interested in checking out more MBTI content, please head over to my YouTube channel, Dear Kristen, or my Instagram page, Dear.Kristen. That's K-R-I-S-T-I-N. If you'd like to see some of my favorite comments from YouTube and if you'd like to participate in my type trend polls. Until next time, guys, have a wonderful day.